Well, please remain standing for the reading from God's word from 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 to 12. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 12. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. It's God's word for his people. You may be seated. Let's pray once again and ask for God's help. So, Father, we know that apart from your grace in uniting us to Christ, we are lost in death and sin. So we pray that you would help us know that our life is found in Christ alone. For those of us here today whose faith is in Christ, we praise you for giving us Christ so that we would not die. And we pray for more to be united to the cornerstone, the living stone, so that on the last day they may not be put to shame, but enter into life eternal forever. And so we pray that you would help us see who we are in Christ and why we're here and what you're doing in us and through us for the glory of your name. Amen. We are going to church. I wonder how many of you said that or heard that, or something similar today. Time to go to church. Or maybe later this afternoon, someone asks you, what did you do today? Or how's your day going? And you will say, we went to church. Now, I know that can be shorthand for corporate worship, uh, or our physical building or corner here in Auburn Hills. But when we talk about it like that, as we're all prone to do at times, we begin to lose the richness of what the church truly is. If we talk about the church like we talk about going to the store or going to a movie or going out to lunch or we begin to think then about the church like we think about all those other things. Moments that fill our days but aren't the defining, driving force of our days. So think about it this way. Think about how you may answer this question. What are you doing today? Well, if it's Sunday, so, well, what am I doing today? I I go to church, and then I go to lunch, and then I go home, and then I go. But brothers and sisters, the church isn't something you put on your calendar, or or somewhere you, you go, or something to do. It's who we are. It's who we are. And the word church richly defines our identity and our purpose as God's people. We're God's people in God's world for God's glory. So you didn't come to church today. You've gathered with the church today. And it wasn't time for church this morning. It's time to get to church family time this morning. And so when we begin to talk about it in those type of terms, What we're actually doing with our words is reorienting our reason for being here. 
It, it reorients what we're doing with our time together. It changes how we enter the building and shapes how we interact then with one another once, once we are here together. And so between now and Resurrection Sunday, we're going to look at a biblical ecclesiology, the fancy word for the doctrine of the church. We have a short practical theology series on the doctrine of the church, the people of God for the glory of God. And my prayer has been and will be that the Holy Spirit would continue to shape us. It would change us, not just our words, but how we move and interact and uh, encourage and live with and walk with one another as God's people living in God's world for God's glory. And so we begin our series this morning in 1 Peter chapter 2, because that's what our section is all about. It's, it's all about how God's people live in God's world, ultimately for God's glory. And we begin to see this. It's identity and purpose, identity and purpose, identity and purpose. And so we're just going to go back and forth. We're going to follow Peter through this time where he goes from identity to purpose, back to identity to purpose, then back to identity and finishes with purpose. And so we see this um, pattern beginning in verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices accepted to, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And I think it's pretty clear that the first thing we notice is that the church isn't a building, at least not in the way we usually talk about it. We're a spiritual house. And so just like physical houses are made of physical materials, the church is a spiritual house made up of spiritual materials. And in God's economy, those spiritual materials are us, are his people. We're living stones being built up to offer spiritual sacrifices, identity, and purpose. It's our identity, and our identity drives our purpose. So who we are, in other words, shapes what we do. And that's what we see in verses 4 and 5. What does it say about who we are? Well, first, the church is the people who come to him, that is, Jesus. And that might seem like it, uh, God leaves it up to us to either come or not come to Jesus, but that's not what come to him means. Uh, at the end of chapter 1 in 1 Peter, uh, Peter writes about saving faith, being born again, not by human strength or human wisdom or human will, but by God's living and abiding word. So saving faith isn't something humans can muster up. It's a gift of God. He speaks and gives us life through faith in Jesus. It's a gift of God, meaning he gets all the glory. But the faith God gives his people moves them to action. It's an action. God gifts, we move. When God gifts you faith, you come to him. You come to Jesus. So the church... It's the people whom God has given the faith to come to Jesus. And this means, friends, that going to church doesn't make you part of the church. It might bring you here into a physical building. You might be around the church who has gathered to worship the one we've come to. But going to church or going along with your family to church, or riding in a car to church, showing up to church, doesn't make you part of the church. God's salvation does not come to sinners by being in a building on Sunday. It, God's salvation is by grace alone. It's this gift. He speaks his living and abiding word, grants us repentance and faith, and we have that faith in Christ alone. We come to him. And so we... What we're doing here is we're gathering weekly to celebrate God's grace in Jesus Christ. Not, not our coming to him. We're not celebrating anything we've done. But in spite of all that we've done and who we are, we celebrate God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. And we're encouraging all those around us to look to Christ. And for those who are looking to Christ, to keep looking to Christ. 
to hope in Christ alone and to keep hoping in Christ alone. We're, we're gathering this morning to join together to sing about Christ and read about Christ and hear about Christ and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ crucified, resurrected, and, and reigning. And so what come to him means here is when we say something like, hey, it's, we're going to church, we begin to lose the fact of, the, of the, the language here that First Peter is teaching us, that we're not just going to, to church, but we're gathering with the church to praise and exalt the one who has saved the church. So friends, going to church doesn't save. Going to Christ saves. And so that not only then means that the, the church are the people who come to him, who have gone to Christ in faith. Secondly, the church are those who are alive in Christ. You come to Christ, and you're made alive in Christ. Look at verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. When God the Father raised God the Son in the power of God the Spirit from the dead, Jesus became the living stone. The living stone. It's a reference to his resurrection. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. And so when sinners are gifted faith and they go to Christ, they become alive in Christ. We're given an analogy to help us grasp what this means. We're like living stones being built up as a spiritual house. And Jesus is the one in whom this house takes its shape, in whom it's being built. As verse 6 says, for it stands in Scripture. Behold, I, this is God, laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So Peter's quoting from Isaiah 28, and he is highlighting the fact that this salvation of sinners for the glory of God's name is all God's plan. This is him. He, he has made salvation possible, and the way salvation is possible is God laid the foundation of Jesus Christ. He is the chosen and precious Savior, meaning he's the only way to life. There's no other salvation but in Jesus Christ. There's no other name in which sinners may find saving grace. It's in Christ alone. He's the cornerstone of God's plan of redemption. But it's not just highlighting who Christ is and how God saves. It's highlighting that to help us understand how our life takes shape from that. God sets Jesus down, and then he builds his people next to him, into him. He's intimately connecting stones to the living stone, making us living stones. So our lives as God's people takes shape from the life of Christ. And just like a house takes shape from the foundation, that pad gets set, and then the studs go up, and the, the house is the exact form as the foundation. So the lives of God's people takes its shape from Jesus. And our lives depend entirely upon the one to whom we're connected. And that's why verse 6 ends with, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so what this means is, is that when God connects you to Christ, when you go to Christ and you're connected to the cornerstone, your entire life changes in the way that now we're not living just for this age or just for this world or just for today. We're now the people in this world who live with eternity in mind. The church are the people who live with eternity in mind. Being made alive in Jesus changes the focus of our days. This is how we're different from our neighbors. We're not just living for this life and what, what we can get, what we can gain what we can make of ourselves. Today matters because eternity matters. Being made alive in Jesus changes the focus of all our days. So we're not the people who live with just today in mind. We live with today in mind in light of the last day that is coming. And just as Jesus was God's chosen and precious Savior, the cornerstone, and that chosenness, that preciousness, 
Jesus being the cornerstone is proved by his resurrected. He was raised from the dead. So God's plan is in fact being accomplished. It is not failing. So Jesus' resurrection proves he's the chosen and precious one. Which means then whoever believes in Jesus, when that last day comes, will not be put to shame. You too will be vindicated for going to Christ. Because we're hoping now in Christ alone. But that hope is not yet fully realized. And in Peter, the people were being persecuted, much like the church throughout all ages will be. People wonder what we're doing here with our time on Sunday morning. Why would you give hours to this? Why would you go there? What are we doing here? This is silly business. That's just the easiest way. Our brothers and sisters around the world are, are being persecuted and martyred and worse for gathering together what we can do freely. But why? When in the days and weeks, the suffering becomes almost unbearable for brothers and sisters around the world. Why? Why, why would they do that? Why do we do this week in and week out? Because we're living today with the last day in mind. We believe that if we've come to Jesus on that last day, we will not be put to shame. We won't face God's judgment on that last day because we're built into the living stone. And why does that matter on the last day? Because the living stone already bore our punishment on the cross for our sins. And because he went into the grave, dying the death our sin deserves, well, there's nothing left for God to give us but honor. Glory. To bring us into life with him forever. There's no judgment left to face. We're not going to be put to shame on that last day. Our hope will be realized. and We'll see him face to face. So the only thing left to receive for those with faith in Jesus on the last day, for those who live every day in light of that last day, is glory and honor. And so the church are the people whose faith has made them alive in Jesus today and alive forevermore in him. So brothers and sisters, let's bring this back to our identity. On a, on, what does this mean tomorrow morning when you wake up? Well, think about it this way. Uh, this is more true of you if you are in Christ. This fact is more true of you than your first name. Think about it that way. Uh, I'm JJ, but foundational to my identity is who God has made me in Christ. What's actually more true of me than JJ is I should wake up tomorrow and say, I'm a living stone being built together with other living stones into the cornerstone. That's more true of me than my birth name. And that is all by God's grace. So it's here then where Peter says, now this mystery of God's grace then begins to inform our identity. It enlivens it. It makes it even all the more amazing that this is true of me. Because this is all by grace. God ordains all things. He says, you've come to Christ because of the living and abiding word spoken. You've been born again. But at the same time, it's, it's due to your fact of being chosen. And then those who don't go to Christ, who reject Christ, who stumble over him, who don't go to him, they do so because they were destined to so we have the truth here that God ordains all things and humans are responsible for their actions. Peter says it in, in, in this way, God appointed Jesus as the cornerstone. God appointed Jesus as the only savior of sinners. This is God's sovereign grace to do so. His, his choice to do so. Free, independent planning to save sinners all by his grace. And the gospel calls all people everywhere to repent. And God alone gifts saving faith, and his living word alone is how sinners are born again into eternal life. And at the same time, all who reject Jesus, who don't believe in him, who stumble over the cornerstone rather than setting themselves into him, do so because that's what they want to do. They don't want Christ. 
they willfully reject Christ. And at the same time, verse 8 says, they were destined to do so. Now, we don't pretend that these two truths are easily fit together. <laughs> They're like the puzzle pieces where the, the, the things just don't interlock. You, you get them close and you're like, but there's still gaps. or These can't really fit, but they do. We don't pretend that they fit together easily because the Bible doesn't pretend they fit together easily. But somehow the piece, puzzle pieces do fit. The tension of God's sovereignty and human responsibility isn't resolved in the Bible. But God isn't just doing this to try and say, like, you just got to trust me, like, I'm smarter than you. He, he's not... He's not trying to put us down or make us feel like we're not smart enough to get it. But it is here, so we have to ask, why emphasize this mystery? And not just here in 1 Peter, but throughout the scriptures. Why does God highlight this mystery so often, that he is sovereign and humans are responsible? Well, I like how Tom Schreiner puts it in his 1 Peter commentary. He says this, the theme of God's sovereignty is emphasized here to comfort us assuring us that the evil in the world is not sundered from God's control. God still reigns, even over those who oppose him and his people. This mystery isn't supposed to be like something that leads to philosophical debates or questions that we can ever really answer or to just like put it away and never talk about it. Just like, oh, it's just one of those things you can never understand, so just not even worry about it. No, it's here for a reason, to comfort us, to assure us that the evil in this world is not disconnected from God's control. So five points, don't let the mystery of God's sovereignty and human responsibility keep you from the reason God gives it. That when sin and evil seem to be spiraling out of control, God still wears the crown. He's still on the throne. And all those who trust in him, in spite what it might look like on any given day, will not be put to shame, no matter how strongly you are ever opposed. God will still be and always be in control. And that leads us then to the third thing we see about the identity of the church in verses 4 to 8. That the faith that moves you to Jesus connects you with those who also come to him. Our faith is not an individual matter, which is vastly different than the air we breathe in our day to day. We live in an age that is expressive individualism. We are all about ourselves and the identity of us being the rugged individual. And so, because that's the air we breathe, we tend to overlook the one letter in verse 5 that changes everything. It's the letter S. One S. You see that in verse 5? You're not a living stone. He says, we're living stones. And that one letter reveals the danger of saying things like, I went to church today. I'm not saying that we can only talk about the church in corporate language. I am saying that in our individualistic age, the thing we're in danger of is not overemphasizing the corporate language, but we're in danger of hardly thinking about the church as a people, as our people. The thing that we're in danger of is thinking that, or, or not thinking that a major part of who I am is who we are. That I think of myself too often in individualistic terms rather than who I am in Christ and what that means. And that's why we've, we've talked about our membership uh, process um, in terms of moving from me to we. It's not just like a, a cool catchphrase. It's because when you are moved into Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not just you. You become a we. 
that I'm not really me without the we. And so the church is the people who God builds together in Christ. The, think about it this way. There's, there's a new house being built um, down the road from our house on my street. Um, and for some reason, they started and they have not been back for some time. Maybe it's weather, I don't know. But they have this house there. I'm, I'm sure they're planning to finish it. But right now, there's no front door. There's no siding. There's windows missing. No garage door. No interior doors. It's just studs. The, the whole thing, it's a house, you can tell. But it's not finished. It's missing a lot of things. And that's a picture of the local church when its members are regularly absent from the rhythm of its life. Now, sure, you can go live in that house. <laughs> Probably be a tad cold, a tad uncomfortable. It's not, it's not even like a mattress on the ground yet. Just, there's nothing inside. It's there. The structure's there. You can, kind of, you can tell. But if you go into it, you're not going to experience the richness that's intended. It's not a home. And that's similar to the church. When, when, when we're absent from the rhythm of its life, everyone misses out on the richness that God intends for his people living in his world. And it's easy to do things like that, to be absent from the rhythms of church life, when, we, when our language reflects too often both the individualistic side of things but also talking about the church in terms of an event or something to do or a building. And so let's stop talking about going to church because Peter wants us to start talking about being the church. And the more we do talk about being the church, the more we'll see how our identity in God's world shapes our purpose in God's world. Because that's where Peter goes. Why does God build us together in Christ? The end of verse 5 says, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And this five points is why the sun came up today. This is why God sustains your heart beating and you have breath in your lungs. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's only in our being connected to the cornerstone that anything we do is acceptable to God. And apart from Christ, we have nothing Apart from Christ, we are nothing. But in Christ, when you come to the living stone, when you're built together with other living stones to the cornerstone, oh, we're, we're God's holy people who exist to glorify God in all we do. And again, you see how this changes everything. It, it makes every moment in our lives, every conversation, Every day at home or at work, every interaction with other people, it, 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 through the power of the Holy Spirit, in being connected to the living stone, they become sacrifices that are offered to God as a servant of his glory. And again, this changes everything because life is not mine to live. Faith in Christ means life is now mine to offer to God. Every day, every moment, every conversation, every meeting, every meal, everything is a time to offer a sacrifice to God. To say, these moments are yours, Lord. Use them for your glory in us and through us. That's why Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul and Peter are picking up on the same theme here. Because in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, the priests sacrificed animals. But since now Jesus is our high priest, who sacrificed himself once and for all to redeem us from sin and death, we don't sacrifice ourselves, we don't sacrifice animals. Our sacrifice is now presented, presenting ourselves daily as a servant of God's glory. However, whenever, wherever he chooses. To be aware that every conversation may have a moment 
where I can give glory to God. So when you get up in the morning, when you're on your way to work, when you're facing your to-do list, when you're planning your day with any children the Lord may have given you, whatever your days look like, is the overarching purpose of your day to remember that as a living stone being built with other living stones into the living stone, that my purpose now in life is to offer myself as a servant of God's glory every day. That's more true of you than your first name. This is who you are. If God has made you, if God has um, b- had you been born again by his living and abiding word, this is who you are. Now, how can you do that? How can the overarching purpose of your day be reshaped by this identity? Well, you, you got to remember who you are. <laughs> I'm not going to do this every day if I forget who I am. That's why verse 9 then, after going from identity to purpose, returns to the theme of identity. But, but you, right? you weren't destined to stumble. You, who are you as the church? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So again, Peter then goes back to this mystery of God's sovereign grace by highlighting that this was all God's purpose. This is all his love on display. You you don't come to Christ because you chose to one day. You were chosen. And he he goes back to that. This is God's sovereign grace on display. You are a chosen race. Now, in the Old Covenant, again, God's people were defined ethnically. He chose a people out of all the people uh, on the earth. It, it was, you were part of the people of God due to ethnicity. It was a chosen at the beginning, but it was still then defined ethnically. But in the New Covenant, the church isn't defined by ethnicity, but by what? You come to him. It's saving faith in Jesus. That's what defines God's people. And because faith is God's gift, then it's all of grace. You didn't choose God, he chose you. And that's then no different than the Old Covenant, even with its ethnic martyr. Look at, uh, or listen to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Even, even though it was ethnically marked, the Old Covenant, it's still all of grace. It was not because you were more in number than any of the other people, meaning God didn't pick them because they were the mightiest or the most populous. He didn't set his love on you and chose you because you were more in number. You were actually the fewest, for you were the fewest of all peoples. So then why did God choose them? But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. God chooses his people not because of anything in them, not because of anything they might do for him, not because he needs anything, but simply because he wants to put on, his display, uh, put on display to the world his great love. Just because he wanted to. You're chosen. Every morning when you wake up, chosen. Chosen is our identity as the church. And that's even more amazing when you realize that God knew all your sin. God knew all your failures. And instead of calling out your name in judgment, he called out your name for redemption. He said, you're my chosen one. Chosen. Next, what's he say again? The church is a royal priesthood. God chose to bring his people then into his kingdom as priests. As priests. And again, in the Old Covenant, priests mediated the presence and words of God uh, to the people through their unique access to God. But in the new covenant, Jesus is our high priest, and he is now the only mediator between God and humans. So we're not mediators in that sense. That's not our mediating uh, priestly work. So what does this mean that we are now a royal priesthood? Well, we're in God's kingdom, but we're mediators now in the sense as priests because we have been given the gospel message. We preach the mediating message of the gospel of the only mediator between God and sinners. So we don't do the mediating work like the priests in the Old Covenant did. 
Now, God's royal priesthood points to the one who accomplished the mediating work. We point to the mediator, Jesus Christ. Now, that's what we're about. That, that should define our days. I have been brought into access to the presence of the Holy Father through my mediator, and now my life is to praise the one mediator and to tell people about him and his mediating work. That means, thirdly then, we're the holy nation. The church is the holy nation. Now, when you hear the word holy, uh, what comes to mind? Typically, what comes to mind, okay, God, right answer, sorry, you know, I just got to rewrite this now, right? <laughs> God, yes, God. What, okay, what comes to holiness in mind when we're talking about us? Uh, things we're to do and things we're not supposed to do. The moral actions come to mind. And that is part of what holy means. It's half of it. God's people are called to holiness. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Why? You be holy, for God is holy. Right? Oh, our lives are to reflect the holiness that was bought for us in Jesus Christ, which covers us in Jesus Christ. So we're to be God's holy people, yes. So, and in, in, in what 1 Peter 1 is talking about is just like you can't really be a Michigan fan and then cheer for Ohio State because that means you're not a Michigan fan. Right? You can't say you're a child of God and then live antithetical to everything God is and does. And we're not talking about perfection. Stay, stay with the context. We're not saying God's people never sin. What we're saying is you can't say I'm part of the church I'm God's holy nation, and then walk out of here and live like God doesn't exist. That's what, he, that's what it means. But that's just part of it. Mor moral holiness is only part of it. Holy nation also includes the other definition of holy that, we, that often gets lost when we're just talking about moral holiness. The other definition of holy means to be set apart. Set apart. God chose us and made us his priests to mediate his gospel message, and he set us apart to do so. He called us out of darkness, called us out of sin and death, to be set apart to live for his glorious name alone. That the, that the whole defining force drive of my entire life is now not what I can get on my LinkedIn resume, or how much I can accomplish, or how much I can, you know, possess, or the things I can do, or what I can become. The, the whole driving force of my life is God has called me and set me apart for the glory of his name. And so the church are the people set apart by God for God. Being part of the church, then, brothers and sisters, means relinquishly, relinquishing any claim that you have on your own life. That, that I am not my own. God chose me. He made me alive in the cornerstone, the living stone, and he has set me apart to live entirely for him. That I'm not my own. I've been set apart, which is why then, fourthly, the church is a people for God's own possession. God's own possession. So how, how different would your day look if you began every morning defining yourselves by these things, which remind us that I am not the master of my life, I'm just the steward of it. That I'm not my own. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, because I've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So now, I don't belong to myself, I belong to God. Now that makes all the difference in how your days look. Who's you belong, whose you are, like who you belong to, determines the why of your life. That's why verse 9 goes from identity and concludes with purpose. Why? Why is this who God has made us? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So why, five points, why has God chosen, set you apart, made you his priests, possessed you as his new priesthood in his world. Why has he done that? So you may proclaim the mighty acts of God who called us out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. And you see how these things just continue to go together. As soon as you go from identity to purpose, you go right back to identity. And going back to your identity sends you right back to your purpose. Because that's how the proclaiming day in and day out is fueled. I mean, think about it. If if you do the same thing every day for however long God gives you breath and life, just think about going the same thing every day. Now, for some of us, it's a little easier. (laughs) You're right. Um, I, I would happily eat the same three things all the time. Becky cannot think of an existence like that. That is boring, monotonous. And I'm like, give me those three things and I'll, I'm happy in my little lane. Right? I don't want to taste anything weird because then I got to go eat what I want anyways. Like just stop wasting time. I'll eat my little things. So, so when we think about life like that though, like day in and day out, the monotony, how, how does this not get boring? How does this not get boring? Well, Peter says it's not just by remembering who you are now. The way our days are just enlivened with joy and energy is also by remembering who you once were. The fueling of our day in and day out proclaiming so that's never monotonous is by remembering who you once were. Look at verse 10. Once. Remember that once. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, and all you had coming was death. But God gave you Christ, and if he didn't, you would die. But now you've received mercy. So remembering who you once were makes who we are now ever more amazing. It's, it's, it, it's like it just keeps compounding. You can't get to the end of God's amazing grace when you just keep remembering where you once were and what was coming. And then remembering that what you have now is not because you did anything, but all by God's free grace and love. That once you were nothing, no people, no family, no future, but now God brought us to himself and made us his people. Once I had nobody, now I got a family. And one that will, one that is always with me through the thick and the thin. Because we all have the same story. And because we all have the same story, not even death will separate us. We've got eternity to look forward to. So now I had no people, no family, but now I'm part of God's everlasting people. And not because God needed us, because of anything within us, but only by God's mercy. And when that's the fuel of your morning, Your days will never be boring. You'll never be monotonous talking about the one who brought you out of death into his marvelous light and life. Because it's all by mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is not us getting what our sin deserves. We should be left on the outside looking in at God's love. We should be on the outside looking in to God's family. We should be left in hopeless despair. But God, once we had nothing, but now, in Jesus, we are the people who have everything, all by grace. That's the church. And so five points, what else could we do if that's our story? Every day, but proclaim the glories of God's mercy and grace to us. And so that's why Peter again turns from identity to purpose in verses 11 through 12. Our identity fuels our living. He says, don't go living like your neighbors. Don't go living according to the spirit of the age or the passions of the flesh. That old old man that's still wrestling inside of you. Don't, Don't go after those. Abstain, he says, from the passions of the flesh and live for the praise of God's glory. And again, how we abstain from the passions of the flesh is remembering that today is lived in light of the last day. The last day is coming. 
And so that helps us not only live now for the glory of God in everything we do, it helps us endure trials and tribulations. Because we're sure that no matter what happens to us or is ever said about us, all those connected to the cornerstone on the last day will not be put to shame. You will be given glory and honor and life forevermore. And so we plod on in love of God and love for our neighbors even when we endure suffering from them because we're witnesses to the glories of God's mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. And that's why the church is the people and not a building. Thousands of people will drive past this building. I don't know about every day, but maybe close. Between Walton and Squirrel, thousands of people will pass by this building. And we're thankful for it. We're planning to expand it. It serves as a reminder to our community that in some generic way, there is a God. Or at least there's still people around that think there's a God. And that's why, brothers and sisters, this building isn't the church. Because we can do and have been chosen and set apart and possessed to do what brick and mortar can't do. To proclaim to our neighbors and the nations the glories of not just some generic God, but the one true God who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's the church. And so five points. Let's preach the glories of the gospels to ourselves every morning so that as we step out into God's world each day, we remember we're not going to church on Sunday or later on the week. We're going out into the world as God's church right now. And every moment he gives us as we remember who we are and what we are here to do. Let's pray. So, Father, we praise you because we're who we are and what we're to do is all a gift of your marvelous grace. All we had coming was the just judgment that our sin deserves. But once we were on the outside, but now we are in Christ. And so we praise you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for the glories of your saving grace to sinners like us. And we pray more and more that the glories of, those gra of, of your grace would shape who we think we are. It would form us more and more into the people you've called us to be. And that our identity would more and more fuel our purpose every day for living, we pray. Amen.